Okay, this is a panel on Wall Street and fraud. And I don't see my colleague yet, Bill Black. <laughs> um, if I would have thought of it and, and knew that there was sound and, and video, I might have shown a little clip of him uh, taking on Charles Keating uh, a couple decades ago. Anyway, hopefully he will show up. He's like the Energizer bunny, and he's always on the move. Um, I think he was flying in from Minnesota or something like that this morning. Hopefully he'll um, get here before I finish talking. Um, I don't do fraud, and so <clears throat> if he doesn't show up, uh, the title will be a bit misleading. Uh, I do financial crises. And uh, at the Levy Economics Institute, uh, we were watching what was going on in the economy in the late 90s. And around 1998, we started calling the uh, great financial crisis that we thought would hit before the year 2000. And of course, all we got was the dot-com crash. And then the economy went on its way again uh, with another bubble through 2007. I met Bill Black in 2004. So I'd been analyzing the trends in the economy, talking about what was going on uh, in the financial markets, especially in mortgage-backed uh, securities. Um, <clears throat> and Bill Black uh, I said in 2004, it's all fraud. I said, Bill, I'm sure there's some fraud, but it couldn't all be fraud. By 2006, I agreed with him. It was all fraud. Okay? However, I think it still is useful to understand uh, the economic forces that were behind uh, the buildup that finally crashed in 2007. Uh, my dissertation advisor was Hyman Minsky. Maybe a few of you might have heard of his name uh, after the crisis hit. He had been writing about uh, financial crises since the 1950s, um, and he had a very particular view of um, uh, why our economy is prone to crises. So what I'm going to present is sort of this background uh, 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 framework for looking at the economy. Uh, in order to tell whether we are moving um, toward uh, a crisis. So in the, um, make sure that works. In the 1950s, uh, he um, started this work and uh, he argued that financial innovation is endogenous. His dissertation advisor was Joseph Schumpeter, who you may know was uh, famous for his analysis of innovations and in sort of the real part of the economy. What Minsky did was to um, uh, extend that to the financial part of the economy. He argued that financial innovations respond to profit opportunities. He gave some examples in his earliest work. Um, they also respond to efforts to get around uh, regulations. The financial innovations tend to stretch liquidity, they increase fragility, they reduce the margins of safety that uh, protect financial institutions from uh, a uh, crisis. When they stretch the fragility too far and a crisis occurs, in the post-war period, the government intervenes, both with um, fiscal policy and with monetary policy that tends to uh, validate all of the innovations that have occurred. If the government didn't intervene and the innovations actually led to failures, then those innovations uh, would be less incentivized to continue. But the problem is that we do intervene. Um, he argued that the path of the economy through time can be relatively stable depending on the institutions that constrain the inherent instability of a financial capitalist economy. He argued that the kinds of in institutions we had in place after the New Deal and after the war um, would promote stability. We actually had a whole generation with no financial crises after World War II. That was the longest period in U.S. history without a financial crisis. Um, However, those institutions we would become less and less, I have to try to figure out how I move my own screen down. 
uh, would become less and less capable of constraining the instability because the stability changes behavior. And so his most famous phrase was, um, stability is destabilizing. To the extent that you're successful in constraining the instability, you will change behavior in ways that will make the economy unstable again. I'm stuck. Both the, sc the screen and uh, the screen move at the same time. That's what was wrong. They were both moving at the same time. There you go. This one's not moving. You want this one to move as well? This one is moving. See, this one's not moving. Okay, sorry. I think we've got it. <laughs> anyway, just very briefly. What Minsky thought he was doing was extending uh, John Maynard Keynes' general theory. Okay, maybe not of too much interest here, but in economics, this was the great work of the 20th century, um, the foundations of macroeconomics. Uh, Keynes had a, an investment theory of the business cycle what Minsky argued was that the problem is he doesn't have a financial theory of investment. So what Minsky added was a financial theory of investment and that is what gives us the potential for instability because of the external finance of investment. Over time, what happens is that firms take on uh, more fragile financing uh, profiles. He had a famous um, uh, classification, they move from hedge, this has nothing to do with hedge funds, it's sort of the idea that you are uh, able to make your payments fairly easily to speculative to Ponzi, that uh, we have two big institutional um, uh, ceilings and floors on the economy that come from the central bank, for example, lender of last resort, and from the uh, big government, that is the counter-cyclical movement of the budget deficits, together these things help to promote stability. But again, stability is destabilizing because uh, people take into account the fact that you have these stabilizing forces and they change their behavior. So, uh, if we look at, 
the post-1980 period, what we see is a series of financial crises. They are increasingly severe. They come increasingly frequently, and they are much harder to get out of. Uh, so the, we had the thrift uh, crisis in the early 1980s, and then the developing country debt crisis also in the 1980s. We had the LBO boom and bust in the 1980s. 1990s, we had the new economy in NASDAQ, and then in the 2000s, we had residential real estate, commodities markets, equity markets. Uh, each of these is, um, has an increasingly big impact on the economy, and they're harder for the government to resolve. So when the crisis hit in 2007, a lot of economists um, started looking to Minsky. Paul Krugman wrote a famous uh, column in which he said, the night we reread Minsky. Now, I rather doubt Krugman had ever read Minsky, and I'm not sure he got it right uh, when he tried to reread him. Uh, and it was great that Minsky got this recognition. Paul um, McCulley of PIMCO called it the Minsky moment. So min many people were looking at Minsky's writings from the 1970s and saying, aha, it's a, a financial instability moment. But by the late 80s, uh, Minsky had sort of changed his focus from these sort of shorter term cyclical movements of the economy to a financial crisis to a longer term evolution of the financial system over the whole post-war period. So in a sense, this also was returning to his dissertation advisor, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who had this uh, vision of the evolution of capitalism. So Minsky took a stages approach in the late 80s through the 90s. He died in 1996, 10 years before the crisis hit. He argued that in the, uh, I, I won't go through all the stages, uh, 19th century we had com the stage commercial capitalism. Then we had the rise of finance capitalism and investment banks that crashed in 1929. And then we got the New Deal and a new kind of capitalism. He called it um, paternalistic, managerial, welfare state. You could think of social democracy or something like that. Um, that was a very stable uh, form of capitalism. It served us well for almost half of a century. But uh, beginning in the late 60s, all through the 70s and 80s, we were evolving to this new form of capitalism that he called money manager capitalism. Um, other people have um, recognized that we had entered a new stage of capitalism and went by a variety of um, terms, often called financialization. George Bush called it the ownership society. Uh, all of these capture elements of what was going on, but I think that Minsky's analysis uh, was the most useful if you're really focusing on the financial system. So the idea is stability breeds instability. We have a massive accumulation of financial assets and the other side of the coin has to be financial liabilities that grows through time. Uh, because it's a fairly stable period, although we have financial crises, none of them is severe enough to wipe out much of the wealth that's been accumulated. So that's an important point a period without a Great Depression is going to accumulate a lot of assets and liabilities. Globalization and securitization, Minsky was the first economist, academic economist that I know of to write about securitization in 1987. He wrote a paper and the subtitle was, that which can be securitized will be securitized. And in the paper he went on to argue, virtually everything will get securitized. And of course he was absolutely right. That was essential to globalization of finance. That made it possible for even, say, the Central Bank of China to have a real uh, 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 stake in the U.S. real estate bubble. It wouldn't have been possible without securitization of mortgages. And then finally, yes, we had deregulation, we had desupervision, but more importantly, we had the movement to self-supervision, which was pushed by the Basel Agreements. So the big institutions, you're too big, you're too complex, you know what you're doing, the regulators and supervisors don't, therefore just supervise yourselves. So all of these things combine to produce this new kind of capitalism. We had a virtuous cycle over the post-war period, relative stability promotes innovations because the stability depresses the net returns that you can get. 
Uh, we had competition from what we used to call the non-bank banks, which was pretty uh, difficult to say. Fortunately, Paul McCulley came up with a name, Shadow Banks. So it's everything that's off the balance sheets of the regulated banks and thrifts. They're competing, again, pushing down the returns. Therefore, you have to increase leverage ratios in order to maintain your return on equity. That increases credit availability. So when you can go to leverage a 300 to one, you have a tremendous increase in um, the credit availability, which then pushes up asset prices. So you have a nice virtuous cycle of more innovations and so on. Uh, I'll just show some data. I could go on and on with data to demonstrate the point that we had changed the financial uh, sector. So here we see the decreasing weight of the highly regulated banking and thrift sector, the uh, light blue and then the yellow. So that is the regulated part of the system. It used to be about 75% of all the assets. That declines to about 20%, and you can see the thrifts are just uh, almost completely wiped out. So we have the rise of managed money. A big part, an important part of managed money is the pension funds. This is 75% of GDP. The pension funds are big enough that when they decide to get into an asset class, they're gonna blow the prices up as they did with the commodities markets. We have uh, the growth of layering and um, of debt on debt, of um, the creation of what we call fictitious liquidity, where financial institutions increasingly are financing their positions in assets with overnight borrowing. Uh, we have casino-like speculation in the stock market and so on, so I'll show a little bit of data on this. Here's the average holding period for a stock. Uh, in the run-up to the 1929 stock market crash, the average holding period had declined to one year. You can see that um, after the, uh, that 1929 crash, we average about six years. It starts to come down again um, during this period of transformation to the money manager capitalism, where it had declined below one year. Here is a way to measure financialization. Uh, and that is the share of profits and value added that go to the um, financial sector. So uh, as a percent of uh, profits and value added, it was about 10%. It grows to 20% of value added and 40% of corporate profits, which if you think about it, if uh, finance really is an intermediate good, which is what it should be, it is pretty crazy to have that uh, capturing 40% of all corporate profits. It came down in the crisis, but I think that it's back up pretty close to 40%. Here's a picture of um, <clears throat> total liabilities relative to GDP. Our previous peak had been three times GDP. So for every dollar of GDP, we had $3 of debt. Uh, you can see how that came down in the post-war period. The um, government debt ratio, of course, increases a lot in World War II and then comes down not because we repaid any of the debt, but because GDP grew. You can see a gradual decline in many of the private sector uh, categories, households and not-for-profits. You can see a bit of a kink in the 2000s because of the uh, housing bubble. Uh, Non-financial corporate, you can also see that rising. A bit of a kink also before uh, 2000. But what I wanted to draw attention to is the light yellow, which is private finance. That was essentially zero at the end of World War II. Private finance, this is financial institutions owing other financial institutions. This is layering of debt on debt. Uh, that grows to 125% of GDP. So rather than financing their positions and assets by issuing deposits, which are very stable, they're issuing liabilities to other financial institutions. Uh, for example, overnight corporate, uh, not corporate, overnight commercial paper. And that is where the crisis started in 2007. Problems there when financial institutions don't trust each other, the whole system uh, it becomes completely illiquid and uh, requires the intervention of the central bank. <clears throat> also, uh, we uh, had, you know, Precisely during the time 
when all of this fragility is building, we have our central bank, the Fed, going around uh, saying, don't worry, everything is fine. So there was this belief that Greenspan had the put on, which meant no risk is too big because Greenspan is backing you up. We had Bernanke, when he was, uh, before he became the chair of the Fed, writing a very famous paper called The Great Moderation, arguing, don't worry, central banks, we know what we're doing now. We are so good at our jobs. You don't need to worry about inflation, deep recessions, or financial instability, because we've got everything uh, under control. In uh, 2007, every year at the Levy Institute, we have the Minsky Co Conference that he had started in 1990. Uh, we had one of the members of the Board of Governors and two Fed researchers at our conference that year. The Fed researchers in April of 2007 were proving to the audience there was no housing bubble. It had already started to burst, okay? So what I'm saying is, we had the Fed trying to reassure financial markets you don't need to worry about risks. In reality, we had the biggest debt, equity, commodity, and real estate bubbles in human history, all at the same time. Okay. And all of these, except for the housing bubble, are all back. Okay. So maybe they're even bigger now. They are propped up by the big government, that is counter-cyclical movement of the budget, and the big bank lender of last resort. <clears throat> in 1966, we had our first budget surpluses since 1929. And uh, so in 1999, or 98, uh, President Clinton went on television and announced we're going to run budget surplus for the next 15 years. We're gonna retire all the debt. I'm sure a lot of the Americans here remember this. Um, and this was taken seriously. Uh, the press applauded. I can show you a Wall Street Journal front page that had two stories with a graph in the middle. The graph in the middle showed the government moving to a surplus and the private sector moving to a deficit. The two columns, each, uh, neither of which mentions the other column, isn't it terrible that the private sector is running a deficit, they're no longer adding to national saving? The other column, isn't it fantastic the government is running a surplus, adding to national saving? Neither column recognizing it's an identity, it had to be true. If the government is running a surplus, the private sector by identity had to be running a deficit which it was. So private debt exploded, and this was the time when we started um, <clears throat> warning that the crisis is coming. Here's a picture. You see, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I show this in classes, the first thing I ask students, what do you notice? Everyone says, wow, it's a mirror image. Isn't it nice that identities are identities? They're true. For every surplus, there has to be a deficit. The government uh, taken as a whole is the red. You can see that it is virtually always in deficit. Never more than a few quarters in surplus since 1929. Otherwise, it's always in a deficit. The private sector, by the same token, is always in a surplus. Maybe occasionally there is a quarter here and there where the private sector is running a deficit. And then suddenly, the Clinton years. The private sector, you can see that there are two long periods with absolutely unprecedented private sector deficits, okay? And we see the red above the line, that was the Clinton budget surplus. So anyway, seeing the private sector spend a dollar six for every dollar of income, you know that this can't go on forever. We didn't think it could go on for very long. Turned out we were wrong. The housing bubble, rebooted everything, and the private sector ran another deficit for several more years, and again, hit almost 6% of GDP. So we knew that something was going to give. As soon as the private sector stopped borrowing to finance spending, the economy was going to crash because it was a consumer-led uh, uh, economic growth, which is very fragile. 
So anyway, turning very quickly to what was going on in the real estate market, so all the Americans know it's a wonderful life and the Jimmy Stewart thrift. Uh, <clears throat> in that model of mortgage uh, creation, you need a loan officer, a bank teller, a home appraiser, and a public recorder. Basically, that's all it takes. Uh, you hold the loans to maturity, and the mutual form, which most of the thrifts uh, took, aligned the interest of the um, owners who were the depositors. So the interests were aligned, the thrifts were extremely safe, before 1974, they virtually never failed, and homeowners virtually never defaulted on home mortgages. We move to the more efficient Wall Street model, which requires a broker, appraiser, lender, servicer, MERS, the industry creation to get around, actually recording in the county recorder, MBS trustee, the rocket scientists, credit raters, CDOs, on and on and on, robo signers when everything goes bad and you got to recover the documents, that is forged. Everyone in this food chain gets paid. Most of them get paid before the very first home mortgage payment is made. The model was originate to distribute, pump and dump, foreclose, and resell. They were capitalizing unrealizable home values. Here's a picture. This is the old days. Here's a picture. This is the efficient model, okay? Not only do they have to get paid, at most of these steps, they have to accurately record the information. In many cases, they have destroyed all the paper documents. So they're all, they only exist electronically. And they, over and over, because the average mortgage was sold 10 times before securitized, you gotta enter the correct address. And often they did not. So this is the problem, a problem. So I, I had kids at the time. Shrek's onion, so you all know what I mean. Uh, every link here was fraudulent. There was fraud throughout the system. The appraisers uh, were pressured. They actually had a petition that they were submitting to Congress every year, year after year. They would gather thousands more signatures saying we are being pressured and blackballed if we won't over appraise the value of the houses to justify the mortgages that are being made. Uh, everything through here, I'm sure you all know what the credit ratings agencies were doing. They had the same problem. If they wouldn't uh, give the rating that was desired by the investment banks, then they would be blackballed and so on. And we know plenty about what the servicers have done. So most fraud was on the part of the lenders. Of course, some of the borrowers were fraudulent too. And now on the part of the servicers. The Fed talked about this as early as 2000, and the FBI warned of an epidemic of fraud as early as 2004, and uh, virtually nothing was done. Certainly nothing was done by the Fed. Okay, why? So I'm still hoping Bill Black will come so that he, can, he can explain this, uh, because this is what I learned from him. Okay, you need it to be extremely complex uh, because you have to be able to hide the fraud and the fraud is always accounting fraud. Why? Why did, they, why did it have to be fraudulent? Because the model was flawed. It couldn't possibly have been profitable. There were too many fingers in the pie. Too many people had to be paid. Uh, you needed mortgages at 120% of the value of the house, okay, which then requires lots of fraud because you have to have appraisers who are willing to go along with this. You have to have the, the reps and warranties uh, when you're trying to package the stuff together and sell it to the pension funds and so on. You had to have fraud. As uh, Bill Black says, the problem is fraud is always the most profitable thing there is. And so any institution that's not willing to engage in fraud automatically is gonna be much less profitable than the fraudulent ones, which means there's a huge incentive for everyone else to be engaged in the same sorts of behavior. So we had uh, about 10 trillion of homes that were mortgaged 
and that was uh, able to generate tens of trillions of dollars of bets. So you have mortgage-backed securities, but then you also have all of the CDOs, CDO squares, and so on. And the uh, demand for this stuff was almost infinite. Going back to the virtuous circle that I showed, uh, that's part of the explanation. And the second part of the explanation is that there was a fear, uh, and two and a half years of reality, that there would be, that government bonds would be disappearing from the financial markets. And so that led to a demand for an alternative since in the past, historically, Americans virtually never defaulted on home mortgages. Uh, the mortgage-backed securities seemed like a good substitute, very easy to get AAA ratings. Um, and then th the problem was that there just wasn't a, enough good mortgage debt, so you had to develop the tranching and then the um, CDOs that still could tranch uh, to get AAA and so on. So the, um, uh, the quantity of debt that could be sort of, uh, for my students I always use Yertle the Turtle, I also had kids reading Dr. Seuss, uh, you know, on the backs of the homeowners. You have this huge pyramid of claims on the backs of some poor uh, homeowner uh, who may not even have bought a new house. About 40% were just uh, cash out equities, grandmas who had been convinced to uh, take out a mortgage on their house. So foreclosure was inevitable. Uh, in large part, it was desired. I mean, that's the point of betting on failure. Uh, and uh, the idea was that once they fail and we foreclose on the house, and MERS was supposed to streamline the foreclosure process, make it a lot quicker and cheaper, then you could resell the house okay, and start all over again. If you uh, want to, to read uh, a, a book that lays out in great detail the kinds of shenanigans that went on, read uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's The Great Crash, which is about 1929. But everything he describes is what we did. Okay, we just rebooted, redid it again. You don't even have to change the names of the chapters. One of the chapters is Goldman Sachs. And what he describes Goldman Sachs doing with the investment trusts is exactly what the big banks were doing with their SIVs and SPVs. It was just a, a way um, for them to um, uh, increase the amount of stuff that they could do. Okay, we look at the crisis response. The response this time was completely different from what Roosevelt had done. So Roosevelt declared a bank holiday, which is a nice thing to call it, when you close all the banks. They're taking a holiday. Uh, he put Jesse Jones in charge of reopening them. Jesse Jones demanded resignations from the top officers of all the banks. He said, I'm gonna put them in the drawer. I might not accept them, but they're there. If I need them, I've got your resignation. He replaced the management that he didn't think um, he could trust with his own people. Uh, they nationalized about half the banks. And we got out of that and created a system that served us well for 50 years. Um, this time, what do we do? Do we have news on Bill? Oh, great. <laughs> Good. Um, so, uh, Hank Paulson goes to Congress. Don't ask me what I'm gonna do with the money. I'm not gonna tell you. I need 800 billion. Congress told him, forget it. He went back with a plan. He had to change. Uh, uh, they had a, a combination of putting some capital in, realized that it wasn't enough, so they started buying bad assets. Then we got a fiscal stimulus, 800 billion over two years, 400 billion. It, uh, it put a floor on how bad the recession would go, but it wasn't nearly enough uh, money. At the, I was uh, part of a workshop that was going to be providing advice, and we got word from the Obama administration the number was going to be 800 billion. And we said, well, why 800 billion? Well, because not a trillion. <laughs> 
It's not a trillion. It's not quite as scary. So uh, I don't think anyone uh, really thought that 800 billion would be enough, but it was all we could get. The Fed, uh, often in deal making uh, with the Treasury, engaged in an unprecedented effort. Uh, the peak outstanding loans at any point in time was 1.7 trillion. However, over a, a period of almost three years, the Fed originated over 29 trillion in loans. These were continually uh, originated every morning. The banks would come back the next day and they would need uh, to renew the loan. So uh, I want you to understand, there was not $29 trillion of loans uh, outstanding at any point in time. This is a measure of the number of loans originated in the effort, which took place over two and a half years. At one point, I was on a conference call with Bernie Sanders and um, Bernanke, and I said, and Bernanke was saying, it was just a liquidity problem. I said, why would you have to lend to some of these biggest banks for over two years? That does not sound like a liquidity problem to me. That sounds like an insolvency problem. He says, we didn't do it. Well, we know we did it. We've got the data. Bloomberg won a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit, so we got the data. Two of my graduate students went through it, totaled it up, it's 29 trillion. They lent at well uh, under 100 basis points. They lent at under 10 basis points, in some cases, to some of the biggest banks. Um, it's very clear what they were doing. They were the low cost provider of funding to the biggest banks. Uh, if we leave out the central banks, 84% uh, of all the lending went to just 14 institutions. You can see about half were U United States and about half were foreign. Uh, one of my former students, now my colleague, uh, Pavlina Chernova, has been looking at inequality. And what we've seen over the whole post-war period is this uh, really disappointing trend, which is that when the economy is growing after a recession, when we're recovering, a larger and larger share of the uh, benefits of the growth go to the very top. So this cut is at 10 percent, but we would see the same pattern at 1 percent or at one-tenth of 1 percent. Of course, the total wouldn't be as big but we will see the trend that every recovery benefits the top much more than the previous recovery did. In the, the recovery from 2009 to 2012, actually the bottom 90% uh, were suffering because of the recovery. So they weren't, they were getting less than zero of the benefits of recovery. Uh, because of the way that we are um, dealing with the crises and the recessions. Too much uh, for Wall Street, not enough fiscal stimulus for job creation. So when Minsky came to the Levy Institute in 1990, he started this project called Reconstituting the Financial System to promote the capital development of the economy. Uh, this still continues. This is the uh, conference we have every April. Uh, this uh, past April, it was on the prospects with uh, President Trump, um, which not too many people were optimistic about. Uh, Minsky would always write an agenda for each one of these conferences and lay out uh, what he wanted people to talk about. And from the first one, this is the um, agenda that he laid out, I think in 90 or 91. A capitalist economy is a financial system. Now, probably for you, there's nothing surprising about this. I can tell you that for 99% of all economists, this makes no sense. Say, what, capitalism, financial, the most rigorous economic models don't even have money in them, much less banks or a modern financial system. So Minsky's arguing that we need to put finance front and center in our uh, economic uh, 
theorizing about the economy. So neoclassical economics, which is the mainstream one, is not useful because it denies that the financial system matters. We actually have two uh, rigorous theorems that demonstrate that it doesn't matter, Modigliani-Miller theorem and then the, the um, efficient markets hypothesis proclaim that finance doesn't matter. The financial structure has become much more fragile. So again, this is in the early 90s. It's even more true now. The fragility makes it likely that stagnation or even a deep depression is possible. Minsky uh, had uh, published a book which really was a collection of his writings in 1982. The title of it was Can It Happen Again? So it was the uh, financial uh, crash with the Great Depression. So could something like the 1930s happen again? In 1982, Minsky said no, it can't happen again. Why? because of the institutions we had put in place to constrain the instability, and especially the big bank, central bank, and the big government. By the late 80s, he started answering, it might happen again. Okay, why? What had happened? In a relatively brief period, he had changed his mind. Well, it was the loss of faith among policymakers, elected representatives, and economists in the use of fiscal policy. And so we had pretty much abandoned that by the end of the 80s, and of course, that remained. I told you that uh, Obama could only get through 800 billion for the worst crash we had had since 1929. We could only come up with 800 billion to deal with that. Instead, we were relying on monetary policy. And so with that frame of mind, maybe we wouldn't be able to mount enough. There he is. I'm finishing, come on up. <laughs> wouldn't be able to mount a sufficient response to the next crisis. Well, we didn't let it happen again in 2007. We only got the worst calamity since 1929 and it spread around the globe and parts of the globe have not recovered, especially Europe. Um, we seem to have recovered. And uh, most people think that we're still on an upward trajectory. If you look at the data, if you look at what the financial system looks like, I don't think that's true. I think they were ready uh, for another one. Although, remember, I said in 1998 we were going to crash, and it didn't happen until 2007. So we could go on. It, this is a huge economy huge inertia, momentum. We might keep growing for a while, but uh, the uh, fragility is there. Minsky said that the fragility uh, makes it likely that stagnation or even a deep de depression is possible. We have now even very respected mainstream economists like Larry Summers arguing we are now in secular stagnation. This is as good as it gets. Uh, we have Robert Gordon with a uh, very interesting book with lots of data, also arguing this is as good as it gets. We're never going to grow like we used to grow. Stagnation is our, is our future. So they come up with uh, complex, completely implausible arguments as to why that's true. A stagnant capitalist economy won't promote capital development, but that could be avoided with apt reform. So last slide, conclusion. The Great Depression represented a failure of a particular stage of capitalism, a stage of capitalism with small government, laissez-faire, and dominance by investment banks. The New Deal promoted a highly successful big government, big bank model. That the problem is stability breeds instability. Um, the instability was promoted by deregulation and by end runs around the regulation. The current crisis decisively repudiates this combination that we've had, a big government but with a neoconservative uh, model, which doesn't let the government um, intervene in favor of the majority of the population, um, and favors self-supervision and socializing the risks when things go bad. 
So what we need is a new New Deal. Minsky said it's not a matter of just going back and finding what we did in the 1930s. That won't be appropriate for the kind of economy we have now. We need a new New Deal uh, based on full employment, shared prosperity, and a regulated and downsized financial sector. I'm done. Again, if you have a PowerPoint. Yep. I don't is know. Is that yours or theirs? This is theirs. I don't know that I'm confident. Probably works the way the others do. Thank you. If you wondered why Kansas had uh, snow yesterday, uh, if you're flying from Minnesota to here, starting at 3 a.m. getting up, uh, you run into a flight cancellation and then a flight delay. My apologies for that. so much. Does the clicker work, Randy? Hi, my name is Bill Black. Um, my primary appointment's in economics, joint appointment in law. I'm also a white-collar criminologist, a recovering financial regulator, and a founder of uh, Bank Whistleblowers United. So I bring together all of those five hats, and it, we ask the uh, more basic question, what if Minsky was an optimist? That was actually a joke, but that's okay. <laughs> Plan B. There we go. So, um, the th subject we were asked to talk about was fraud as a business model on Wall Street and more generally in banking and finance. So. Back in that uh, day, uh, I was uh, held a series of positions as a savings and loan regulator. Um, and, uh, every failure came across our desk, and this was an era when hundreds of failures were occurring. We still put places into receivership, which we've largely stopped doing. So we decided we ought to learn about these institutions. The we, in this case, was the litigation division. Uh, which is an odd place, you might think, to be doing this learning, but somebody had to do it, and uh, we volunteered ourselves. So we autopsied every failure, and we looked for commonalities. One of the things that's taught us was that the folks who were absolutely the worst were the econometricians. And they were the worst because it was guaranteed they would be the worst. They were going to evaluate policy uh, should we, for example, allow uh, direct investments where you have an ownership stake as opposed to a lender position uh, on the basis of either reported income or change in stock price? And both of those things were going to be driven by accounting fraud. So the institutions that engaged in the most accounting fraud would invariably report that they were the uh, most profitable savings and loans in America and their stock would uh, appreciate like crazy. And so econ econometricians would say, look, direct investments must be good. We have real world experience. You can't beat the quants type of thing. So uh, in his day, George Benston was the, the uh, particular expert on this. He looked at 34 institutions that had already been able to do this type of investment, direct investments. And he said, not only should you not regulate them and restrict them, they should be the model for your entire industry. You should encourage the other 3,000 savings and loans to do the same thing. Well, within 18 months, all 34 had failed. Pretty bad, you know, you can't go old for 34 and even stay in the lowest rungs of minor league baseball. But. Um, you'll see that that's not necessarily the um, same trend in economics. Then there's this guy named Daniel Fischel, and uh, he said Lincoln Savings and Loan, and many of you are old enough to have heard of Charles Keating and Lincoln Savings and Loan, the worst fraud, and therefore reported the most profitable savings and loan in America. He said this institution should again be your exemplar for the industry instead of giving them grief. Uh, you should be uh, praising them because they pose no risk. Uh, 
And, you know, as I said, it's a 3,000 uh, industry, uh, 3,000 member industry, and he got the absolute worst institution and called it the absolute best institution. So that's a 3,000 position error when there are only 3,000 positions. Pretty bad. And then there was this guy named Alan Greenspan, uh, who also said that um, Lincoln Savings posed no foreseeable risk of loss to the federal insurance fund. At $3.4 billion, I know it seems quaint in uh, modern terms, but at $3.4 billion, it was the most expensive failure in U.S. history until Washington Mutual, which, you know, is some accomplishment. Now, what happened to these three folks? George Benston got moved from Rochester to an endowed chair at Emory. Uh, Daniel Fischel was made dean of the U Chicago Law School, and Alan Greenspan was never heard of again, <laughs> or maybe not. So the key recognition was that CEOs were looting their banks, right? Yes, they were doing things that were deeply unprofitable in reality, but they were doing things that were going to produce massive ac phony accounting income. And we discovered through the autopsy process the recipe uh, for this. Now, this is one very large fraud scheme repeated many times in many countries. It is not the only fraud scheme. It is not the only form of bank abuse, so it's not it, the entire universe. But here it is. The recipe had four ingredients. One, grow like crazy. Stop me when this sounds like maybe the current crisis. Two, make really, really crappy loans, but with a high nominal yield. Three, have extreme leverage. And four, establish only trivial amounts of allowance for loan and lease losses. If you do those four things, well, then you get three sure things, but note, to be able to do this, you have to gut your underwriting and your controls. And that's why that's the great tell in the poker sense of the word for regulators who are competent, which is a small and declining set. So the three sure things. One, the bank will immediately report record income. Two, the CEO, followed only by days or months, will be made spectacularly wealthy. And three, farther down the road, the bank will suffer catastrophic losses. And when banks, enough of them suffer catastrophic losses, really bad things happen to the world, and we all get to pay many of these things. So if a number of banks follow the same strategy and they're large enough relative to the GDP, then you can also hyperinflate a bubble. And the saying in the trade is, as a lender, I was a banker as well, didn't mention that part, um, is that a rolling loan gathers no loss. As long as the bubble is expanding, simply refinance, book new gains, send them more cash so that they can stay current, it's all good. Well, it's actually all terrible, but it looks really good. So. Um, how do we use this recipe? Uh, well, it was the key to how we approached the entire crisis. Economics has got some truths. People don't truly optimize in the way economists say, but they often try to kind of sort of uh, do it, and that means you're going to get a distinct pattern because there are better fraud mechanisms and there are worse fraud mechanisms. And over time, people will tend to use the better ones. So this let us identify and close the frauds, help identify the fact that there were major regional bubbles, for example, in the Dallas area, and it gave us their Achilles heel. We realized that if we restricted growth, we would kill this scheme. And so we, A, targeted, this was fun. Remember I was litigation director? You go in front of the judge, and the judge says, let me guess, um, make sure I got this right, Mr. Black. There are 500 savings and loans reporting that they're gap insolvent. Yes, Your Honor. But you're not here to close those. No, Your Honor. You're here to close the most profitable savings and loan in America. Yes, Your Honor. 
Well, I knew government regulators were morons, but until this day, yada, 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 yada. You can imagine how this is going to go. We persisted. So, and it shows why deregulation has these effects, right? Deregulation is what allows you to gut your underwriting and your control systems. Under the general logic, which works well for honest people when there's no and I'll about to explain this term, Gresham's dynamic, going on that, hey, an honest bank, competent bank is going to run underwriting well anyway. And indeed, that's what our rule was, by the way. It wasn't a best practices rule, it was a minimum practices rule, right? So we would expect an honest, competent bank staff to greatly exceed the underwriting requirements that we had. We would also expect fraudulent folks to go well below the standards we set. It's really the perfect rule. It poses no, imposes no cost on honest bankers and gets rid of the bad ones. We knew we had to uh, ignore the econometricians and go ahead. We knew how we could explain this fraud mechanism in court and we understood the fundamental which is that accounting is the weapon of choice in finance. So we closed them, all those good types of things. And there was the inevitable National Commission. And this is the inevitable National Commission right at the beginning, summarizing the typical large failure grew at an extremely rapid rate, achieving high concentration of assets in risky ventures. Every accounting trick available was used. Evidence of fraud was invariably present as was the ability of the operators to milk the organization. Now this is written by a neoclassical economist. Neoclassical economists have to be tortured to utter the word fraud, right? They don't write like this, that it was invariably present is one of the staggering things in any government uh, point. And because we knew who we had to go after and how to make the case and such, um, we made over 30,000 criminal referrals in the savings and loan debacle. At peak, 1,000 FBI agents out of a total staff of um, right around 3,000 were assigned to savings and loan investigations and prosecutions. An incredible prioritization of resources. Created the top 100 priority list to make sure we went after absolutely the most elite and most damaging fraudsters. That involved roughly 300 institutions, roughly 600 individuals, CEOs, CFOs, chairman of the board. Virtually all of the people on that list of 600 were prosecuted. We had a 90% conviction rate. In addition, we brought over 600 civil fraud actions as the government and over 3,000 enforcement actions, and these are actions against the individuals overwhelmingly, to do things like remove and prohibit them from all insured institutions. So, how many people remember the 1990-1991 Liars Loan Crisis? Ah, that's a trick question. Okay, like all good frauds, yes, I know, I, I give hints. It's, it's, it's a prof thing, right? Um, like all good financial frauds, and I, I know people from this area contest this, but Orange County is actually still the best uh, at originating frauds. I, admittedly, Miami area is a, a close second. Okay, so uh, these liar's loans, which of course were not called liar's loans in that era, began in Orange County. And uh, we drove them out of the industry, and we drove them out of the industry for the basic reason you already know at this point. They are the exemplars of the recipe that I just gave you, in which they're going to gut their underwriting. And our examiners said, hey, this doesn't make any sense unless you're trying to make fraudulent loans. Right? And we said, you're right. And so we began kicking them out. At which point, the biggest and the baddest of them, which was then called Long Beach Savings, voluntarily gave up federal deposit insurance and its federal charter for the sole purpose of escaping our jurisdiction. 
became a mortgage bank, renamed itself AmeriQuest, which I think is probably a name many people in this room will have heard. And of course, after they were nailed three different times for various frauds and abuses, we made Roland Arnau our first prisoner of the banking crisis, or our ambassador to the Netherlands. Well, everyone gets that question right, right? So he just happened to be the largest, if you pick the particular time period, the largest uh, financial contributor to the then sitting president of the United States, who was the second Bush. All right, that's bad, but that's, you know, politics type of thing, bad. But what's really astonishing is that Citi and WAMU purchased this absolute pile of crap when everyone knew it was an absolute pile of crap and where no one was pushing them to do it as a regulatory matter. Right? They eagerly did it and, you know, shockingly, it produced enormous fraud. And the Fed, and only the Fed, had authority under the Homeowner Equity Protection Act of 1994 to stop all liar's loans, regardless of whether the institution making them was federally insured, which, of course, they refused to do until 2008, after liar's loans essentially had died. And then they delayed the effective date of the rule for 11 months because you wouldn't want to inconvenience the last fraudulent uh, lender in the United States or something. Okay, so economists came and looked at the savings and loan stuff, and we had the great benefit that we had two really good economists come and look. We didn't invite them in, they were, did it on their own. George Akerlof and Paul Romer. George Akerlof, Nobel laureate in economics in 2001. Paul Romer, currently chief economist of the World Bank. This is how they concluded their article, and I want to emphasize the title of their article, Looting the Economic Underworld of Bankruptcy for Profit. Right? So it's got everything, those three sure things that I was talking about. It's a looting process. You make a ton of profit as the insiders, and then it collapses, and somebody else bears the, the cost, right? So. Akerlof and Romer made this the last paragraph of their article in order to emphasize it, and you can see that they were writing to their fellow economists. Neither the public nor economists foresaw that the regulations of the 1980s, and by the way, what they mean by that was the deregulation of the 1980s, were bound to produce looting, nor unaware of the concept could they have known how serious it could be. Now stop right there. How can you be an adult and be unaware of the concept of fraud? Uh, economists can be. All right, or at least neoclassical ones. Thus, the regulators in the field, not the fancy people or semi-fancy people like me, the regulators in the field, the examiners, who understood what was happening from the beginning, found lukewarm support at best for their cause. Actually, they found total opposition from economists. They're just being polite. Now we know better. If we learn from experience, history need not repeat itself. Or if we don't learn and triple down and quadruple down, we can make it vastly worse. So, hey, same thing happened with Enron. Same thing happened in Iceland. Same thing happened in Ireland. Probably happened in Spain, but nobody looks. Right? Okay, so this is all bad, but we haven't also understood how it can get really bad. Right? Savings and loan debacle was contained. Re-regulation began one year after deregulation began in the heart of the Reagan administration over the op intense opposition of the Reagan administration. You may have noticed re-regulation was kind of more delayed uh, in the current crisis. So 
how do you go from, I'm sorry, spots of fraud to really epidemic levels? Well, this guy that wrote a really, really long time ago, this is right about 50 years before Adam Smith wrote uh, Wealth of Nations, um, so put it in this way, the Lilliputians look upon fraud as a greater crime than theft, for they allege care and vigilance with a very common understanding can protect a man's goods from thieves. This is the line I love and why we still read him centuries later. But honesty hath no fence against superior cunning. Where fraud is permitted or connived at, or hath no law to punish it, the honest dealer is always undone, and the knave gets the advantage. In other words, an effective rule of law is not a bad thing for honest business people. It's the only thing that makes possible honest business people. Well, almost 250 years later, economists caught into this same idea, and it was in that article that led George Akerlof's Nobel Prize, his famous article, if you've studied any economics, on markets for lemons. And he actually gave this dynamic a name, a Gresham's dynamic. Dishonest dealings tend to drive honest dealings out of the market. The cost of dishonesty, therefore, lies not only in the amount by which the purchaser is cheated, the cost also must include the loss incurred from driving legitimate business out of existence. Oh, this is pretty scary stuff if you're an economist. So, let's flash forward to the current crisis. Because, you know, no one could see it coming other than Randy in 1998 or whatever. Okay? From 2000 to 2007, appraisal organizations delivered to Washington officials a public petition signed by 11,000 appraisers. It charged that lenders were pressuring appraisers to place artificially high prices on properties and blacklisting honest appraisers and instead assigning business only to appraisers who could hit the desired price target. So, one of the things I did back in the day to get those over a thousand felony convictions was testify as an expert witness in the prosecutions. And since I was a government employee, I was free, uh, which, you know, prosecutors kind of like. Uh, so, the first point to make is appraisal fraud is great for explaining to a lay jury because they get it within literally 15 seconds when you explain, no honest lender is going to inflate an appraisal or permit inflated appraisals on a wide scale basis because it's your great protection against loss. And you can see everybody in the jury box nodding their head and going, yes, that makes perfect sense. So A, this is really good evidence. When you see this, you know you have fraud. But second, they, put in writing. They didn't use the term Gresham's dynamic. They never heard of it, I'm sure. But they absolutely explained the Gresham's dynamic, how it was created, who was creating it. And they did this in 2000, and they actually started in 1998. But it's a bunch of rival groups, and to get together a common strategy and common language takes about two years. But every one of the banking regulatory agencies has appraisers who would have been talking with these people and would have known since 1998 that you were getting this endemic appraisal fraud. They didn't sit back. They didn't short stock. There's no movie ever going to be made about them. What they did with their knowledge, they tried to prevent the crisis. And they got absolutely stoned. Okay, well, how about that? How big was it? Well, we actually did surveys, God forbid, in almost exactly the right years, 2003 and 2006. <laughs> in 2003, 55% of the appraisers answered the survey, the survey that they had personally been subjected to coercion to inflate appraisals in that year. By 2006, it was up to 90%. Cuomo, in his role as New York AG, does an investigation and finds endemic. The stuff in the 
turned over in the WAMU litigation about appraisers is enough to make you absolutely sick. And bad things happened to honest appraisers. They lost the business. A group called, called Demos picked this up in 2005. Nothing happened. Here's another guy. You may think, who cares about the Iowa AG? He was actually the most active in the AGs, and the AGs were the only ones active, not at the federal level. Said, over the last several years, the subprime market has created a race to the bottom, a Gresham's dynamic, in which unethical actors have been handsomely rewarded for the misdeeds, and ethical actors have lost market share. The market incentives rewarded irresponsible lending and made it more difficult for responsible lenders to compete. Well, okay, but that's appraisers and that's state AG. I mean, we like the Fed, I mean, guys that may or may not decide elections, right? The FBI. So, in open house testimony in a series of press conferences, trying to get publicity, trying to get this warning out, not some random guy, but the guy, Chris Swecker was his name, in charge of this, fully authorized by the FBI, gave two warnings. One, that there was a developing epidemic, his word, of mortgage fraud, and two, predicted that if it wasn't stopped, it would cause a financial crisis. Crisis, again, being his word. Right? So we got that warning. Well, <laughs> but, you know, how about the industry? Well, they don't deserve much credit for this. This actually came from a lone individual who hired Mari to do this. Mari on its own probably never would have done it, but Mari was the acronym of the lending industry's own anti-fraud institute. And they issued five warnings that went out to every lender who's a member of the MBA, which is essentially everybody, in two th early 2006. One, stated income loans are open invitations to fraudsters. The fraud incidents, that study they did for somebody else, is 90%. <laughs> Nine, zero. Um, three, the stated income loan deserves the nickname used by many in the industry. By this time, they were called liar's loans behind closed doors. And it appears that many members of the industry have little appreciation for the havoc created by these loans, which were all the rage in the early 1990s. That was the point about the non-crisis, um, but it did cost millions of dollars, hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions, of course, does not create a crisis in the size of the economy of the United States, but it should be a warning, right? <laughs> and federal regulators have expressed safety and soundness concerns. So this is a really good, uh, we call them in the biz, e econ and social science, natural experiment, right? Are they making these loans because some evil government type has forced them to do it, or are they making these loans because it's a really good way to maximize your income, right? Subprime you could have some issues about, but not liar's loans. Even the Bush administration at its absolute worst and the Clinton administration at its absolute worst always were negative about these kind of loans. They just refused to regulate. And the result was disaster. How are we time wise? Should we stop? He's saying. Oh. Okay. <laughs>